I didn't do it. So for all, uh, the, 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 the Mishkan could not be built on Shabbos, as important as it was, the Mishkan represents the, the ultimate in our creativity and productivity in the world in, in an external way. In other words, taking the world we see, the physical world, and fashioning it into a more productive world, a healthier world, a more technologically advanced world, and a more meaningful world. And all of that is part of our mission. And Shabbos, we step back from our, our cooking and uh, sewing and, and uh, hammering and building, and we, we focus on internal creativity. So there's not, there might, one of, this is one of the places where there's the mitzvah of Shabbos. Now, this is not the first place. Even in this, uh, this book itself, we've had it mentioned before. And it, in the first place we have it is in the Ten Commandments, which is in, in, uh, earlier on in this book. And there it's uh, the language is, and the Hebrew, the Hebrew is uh, you know, very precise. And, and in Hebrew, um, especially pre prefix, uh, prefixes and suffixes and vowelization, all it, it could look like the same exact word, but the vowelization um, will give you insight into exactly what it what's meant to say, which is a little different than English, where a word is kind of a word. So in the Ten Commandments, it's, it says that six days you shall do work. So do work, it, and the seventh day you rest. That is seen by some commentaries, and we may have discussed it at the time, I don't remember, um, as a statement of reality. People work. Even if they're not working a salary job, people are, are just being alive means being going out there and doing something, even in your own, own home, using the materials of the world to create a better life, a, a usable life, a more pleasurable life for your family, a more meaningful one. So it's, it says six days of shall work, which is like a given, and the seventh day rest. That's the outlier. There are those who will say that six days you shall work. In other words, it's an imperative. And uh, actually, discuss the Shabbos and Shul. There's the, the idea of of um, how the Torah says that uh, the language of scripture is the human is born to toil. And it doesn't mean to slave away necessarily, but it means to exert effort beyond the status quo to try to better uh, our, our lives and our, our world in, in our sphere of influence. So because the idea of inertia or status quo is really somewhat uh, anathema to Jewish spiritual thinking because where we, we have we look at life as, as an opportunity, a gift of God when we want to make it meaningful. And making it meaningful means somehow upgrading it, making this moment as, I could just sit and, and let it pass or I could make it meaningful. I could do something that to, to make myself, make the world around me, some, uh, uh, someone else's life a little bit brighter. So the idea of um, it's it's seen by some as not, it's six days of shower work. In other words, not that it's technically a mitzvah to work, but that's our job. That's our mandate in life is to work. Again, not necessarily a salary job, but to do something, to be creative in the world, to make and creative means taking status quo and saying what can I do and upgrading that status quo. Maybe not even uh, necessarily to the uh, the onlooker, but we know. We have done that something to, to so that the world in this hour is somehow a little bit more put together or usable or brighter because of how we spent that hour. So it's imperative to do work. This um, uh, uh, verse, verse number two, in the Hebrew reading of it, if you're looking at it, like it says in the Torah, it's written in the Torah, the Torah is written without vowels. It looks identical to the words that are used in the Ten Commandments, except that the vowelization on, on do work, teyase or taase, um, which is, means doing, um, that it changes. It changes from what was said ta'ase, which is what we said, uh, that do work, that's a, a, a proactive do work, to in this verse, te'ase. 
Teasa means it shall be done. Very different. So to say that you've got to do this work or that your work be done. And the work being done means it's not necessarily with my engagement. Maybe I can get someone else to do it. So what is that? Uh, to, for six weeks and six days, your work shall be done. Instead of your work, you shall do your work. So let's, let's look at a, um, and here it's, it, it, they, the way they translate his work may be done only for six days because they're, they're trying to find a, a, a way within the, the context to make it flow as making sense. But what it really means is the work shall be done. So let's take a look at, that's just the technical Hebrew of it. So let's look at 271 on the right side, the left column, it begins number two, it says work may be done for six days. Now again, the actual word doesn't, doesn't say what may be done. It's your work shall be done for six days. So the use of the passive voice, work shall be done, to describe weekday work teaches us that we must not invest all our energies in doing it. We should, so to speak, almost allow it to happen by itself. Okay, so this is a kind of, I think, a delicate balance that Jewish moral thinking, spiritual thinking, Hasidic thinking wants to help to guide us or into how we engage, how we, our mindset of engaging our worldly pursuits, because we all have them. On the one hand, worldly pursuits are what we're built for. If we don't engage the world, we're not going to refine the world. And it, it, first of all, in real life, most of us, actually someone just sent me a, um, um, in real life, there's, we all have, most of us have to work you know, to be able to pay bills. But aside from that, we just to get things done, be able to live. But as we have said, it's actually, it's a good thing. It's important because when we're, we're using God's world in a productive way, if what I've done today was work in my, uh, in my backyard for my tomato garden and I've cultivated it and now I'm growing tomatoes and I, I take those tomatoes and I, I make a, a salad and I sit uh, maybe with friends or family and I, and I have a meal, well, I've cultivated the land, which is an important thing. And then I've made myself something to eat and given myself the nutrition, something healthy, which helps me to be, uh, to, to be able, functional, to be able to impact the world properly, to spend time with, with uh, family and friends over it and hopefully had a, a meaningful conversation and strengthened uh, a relationship. That's something. So. Spending time outside of my garden, if I had one, that would be, it's, it's not finding the cure for cancer, but it's, it's certainly, it's, it's a meaningful thing. And that's the, the, the work we're talking about. It could be working at, in a cubicle for Verizon too. But the idea is that we're, it's not, when work, we're not, I'm not, uh, uh, because of the, the usage of the English language and, and the inferences we may draw from words, it doesn't mean work necessarily for salary, for, for uh, you know, for a company, uh, and, you know, do, the, what we call going to work. Work means being productive and creative. It could be in our own home, no salary or anything, but the idea is that we are using God's world, the ingredients of God's world to create a more productive um, and uh, structured world and maybe even a better society. So on the one hand, I get up in the morning, right? Ten Commandments said, six, six days it shall work. I have, to, I have to engage the world. At the same time, when I get up in the morning, when we get up in the morning, and I want to look at life's priorities, I want to recognize that at the end of the day, my relationship with myself, my self-image, my self-knowledge, my self-awareness is critical to me being a, a, a healthy human being. Um, 
and it, it's really it's really step one in me being uh, a a productive human being because yes I can be productive and I maybe I shouldn't wait to be productive until until I have myself all figured out but I I, I need to be able to have, have my mind and my heart and my soul in order to be able to bring my best self to that productivity and that's critical my relationships are are critical the 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 tomato patch it'll go and winter will come and it, it, it it's it's what i did whatever i do important is in a sense eternal but the tomato patch isn't relationships are my relationship with god my relationship with my fellows my responsibilities to my family my relationships with my family these are all things that if i'm getting up in the morning and and structuring my priorities about where to put my best self and our, where the, my, my focus should be are as far as um, energies of putting myself out there because it's, we're, always, we're pushing against the inertia, we're break, uh, pushing against the status quo and that takes energy. As much as I want to, and I need to be productive in the world, the, as far as the emphasis and where I want to make sure if I have X amount of, of uh, energy to, to expend, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm taking care of, of what we can say is a little higher on the list of priorities first. Uh, in, in, uh, in Jewish schools, just it just strikes me now, in Jewish schools there's, uh, that I've gone to, and I think many of them, Jewish day schools, there's half a day of Jewish subjects and half a day of secular subjects. The Rebbe was, uh, and this isn't done everywhere, but the Rebbe was uh, strongly in favor that the Jewish subjects be um, studied in the morning. Because in the morning the kids are fresh, and, and as far as putting their minds and their attention to things. And so not only is that is just as far as triaging their, their energy, but it was also a message to the kids as to priorities. It, the Rebbe was not denigrating the uh, uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, or whatever was going on uh, in the second part of the day, but there is, there's important, and there's important, and we have, it's okay to have a scale of priorities, and we should have a scale of priorities. So in this sense, it says, when we, we're working, and we're out, and we're, it's the tomato garden, or I'm sitting in a cubicle of Verizon, and I'm doing something, it's a good thing. Still, no. I say, I'm not going to put home. The, that's not where I, my 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 deeper energy is. My soul energy is. Of course, I'm doing it, and I should pay attention to it, and I should do it well. If I'm doing it, do it well. But as far as my my day's goal, my day's goal is to be who God created me to be. My day's goal is to make sure I'm taking care of of all my relationships. Now. In, or, and my day's goal is to be productive in the world. That's what God wants me to be. That's what my relationships need. But they, what they need is the, the, my work is in many ways a, a medium to a, an objective. An objective is for me to be who God told me, created me to be. It, that my work is for me to be able to, to keep on my responsibilities to my loved ones. And my, my work is a way for me to impact the world. And, and in a positive way, hopefully I'm taking care of customers in society. But it's, it's, it's as far as centrality of the objective, my own soul, my own spiritual, emotional health, that of my loved ones, my relationship with God is going to be a higher priority. So it's, we have to be very careful. This does not mean in any way at all that to denigrate the idea of going to work and you know in doing something honest and pumping gas and, and with that i'm taking care of my life that that's a good thing and i should and i should be comfortable with it and and, and uh, recognize that that's something that i'm where i'm fulfilling what god wants me to do but when i wake up in the morning first i'm going to take some time to pray i'm going to you know get myself grounded with my family then i'm going to go off to work with the hope that god willing i'll come back and i'm going to have done what I needed to do 
and then get back to what's my deepest priority. And, and I'll, I'm going to pray again. I'm going to study. I'm going to spend time with my family, whatever it is. So in this sense, the, the Torah phrases the idea of work is let, that it shall be done. It doesn't say you should do it like it said the other time. It says this, it shall be done, which means it's a little distant. It's that it, it's getting done, but I'm not, it, I don't have really have all my, my pistons of, of energy and, and soul focus into it. There's, it, again, it, it's a, a, I think it's a nuanced idea, but I, I hope we, we can uh, appreciate the balance. You know, there, there's a story of the third Lubav Chaleve, one of his Hasidim who, who sold hats. And apparently, the Rebbe saw it obsess, um, consuming so much of his attention that he was neglecting what he, who he needed to be as a person, as a as a father, as a husband, or, or whatever was going on. Because the story doesn't doesn't give us the details. So the Rebbe said to him that um, I'm 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 happy that uh, you know that you have uh, this 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 job and this business, and you're able to support yourself. But it's it's odd to me. Um, I'm sorry, it was shoes. I wasn't say hats. It was shoes. We sell our shoes. So the Rebbe said to him, "I've seen all my life. I've seen feet in shoes. That's the first time I see a head in shoes." Um, it, which is, I think it translates okay, but it was in Yiddish. The idea is that your 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 head is it shouldn't be totally invested in shoes. The head should be in. In, in the more uh, psycho-spiritually refined thing, um, elements of your life. And you have to sell shoes because selling shoes is good for society. It's who God created to be. It's, it's, it's all important stuff and take care of your family, but still your, your highest self, you wanna reserve for something a little bit beyond the shoes. Okay. Um, so the next <clears throat> paragraph is, in other words, notwithstanding the importance of our weekday work, especially if you're engaged in refining the world and making it into God's home, which we've said that the entire tabernacle represents our home, our, our lives, and we want to make our lives into, into a tabernacle, which means that no matter what we're doing, as a, a lawyer, a doctor, a shoemaker, a gas pumper, we're, we're creating, we're bringing godliness into our lives. But our work must not be allowed to encroach on our set times of prayers, Torah study, charitable pursuits, educating our children, and so forth. If we devote all our energies, energies to work, it will prove very difficult to divorce ourselves from it when the Sabbath comes. So this is uh, an idea. Also, it's like, where do we live? Instead of when the Sabbath comes, I mean, uh, just think about it any day. If, if we want to pray, and the most difficult time of prayer Talmud says the most meaningful time of prayer is the middle of the day, the mincha, the afternoon prayer, even though we pray three times a day. We pray in the morning, we pray in the afternoon, we pray at night. When we pray in the morning, it's it's a fresh new day, and you can uh, sit down to daven before the mind is so cluttered, hopefully before you even start reading your emails. At night, you wind down, and also you can take some time for God. But to, to take time in the middle of the day, First of all, the taking of the time itself could be a struggle. But deeper than that, we would each know within ourselves, if we're in, in, in the middle of a day and pursuits, and now to unplug the thought process, the bandwidth, and open ourselves to a relationship with God, when we're in the middle of doing something, we've been doing various things, we're going to go back to doing other things. And now to somehow make that space is not an easy thing. It's not an easy transition. And it's more difficult when we've been, you know, head over heels into something. And how, how am I going to get out? If I've been engaged and doing it properly and doing it successfully, but always play, playing in the back of my mind is my deepest priorities, then it's easier to put something in pause, take some time out, and say a prayer because a corner of the mind has never really left. That's the, 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 the feeling of a bond, the connectedness with God. 
So here it talks about not and davening as a Shabbos, but uh, uh, prayer and Shabbos are actually very closely related because uh, prayer is called like the Shabbos of the day, and the Shabbos is the day of prayer because it's, uh, prayer is all about relationship with God, and so is Shabbos. If we devote all our energies to work, it will prove very difficult to divorce ourselves from it when the Sabbath comes. Thoughts and words of work will haunt us. I don't know what haunt means, but the, the idea is that there's, there's noise in that. But if we preserve a sense of balance throughout the week, we'll be able to focus properly on the holiness of the Sabbath when it comes. In this context, it is significant that this command was given immediately after Moses descended from, descended from Mount Sinai. We're told that right, Moses came down in Kippur, second tablets. The next day, the 11th day of Tishrei is when he's given the, the commandment to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle. After having secured God's forgiveness for the incident of the golden calf. Second tablets means, okay, another shot, forgive you, and now moves on to the tabernacle. As we have seen, idolatry originates in the error of ascribing autonomy to the created beings designated as the conduits for his beneficence. We had discussed, I'm pretty sure we discussed it here, but I think it's, we should just to review it, that Maimonides writes in his book of laws, he gives a little bit of a history list lesson when it comes to idolatry. And his, his question is, um, his inferred question is, how did idolatry ever, how did we end up forgetting about God? Adam and Eve know about God. Their kids know about God. There, it's, it's, it, it was, there was no question in Adam and Eve's family whether there was a God. They were created by God. And so when did they forget? When did people forget? So it says that in the time of, of Enosh, one of the early generations, people started, everybody recognized God, but people felt that it was proper to not only wake up in the morning and say, thank you, God, for this world, but they got up in the building and said, thank you, God, for this world, and thank you, sun, for shining. Because they reasoned, come in someone's house and I'm, I'm, I'm getting a meal so I say thank you to the, uh, the householder, the man or the woman who owns the house, and then to the person serving. Say thank you to them too. Even though the, the servant uh, is only serving and it's not, uh, it's not their food and the, they're not uh, the one who's actually, um, technically it's not, it's not their expense, but they are the, the conduit to give, and they're, they're, they're giving it to me. So you say thank you to the waiter. So they, are, they said, so we, why should we not thank the sun? It's nice and polite. And thank the rain. And thank uh, is all the forces of nature, even though God created them. And God blesses us through nature. So we'll thank, say thank you, God. I'll say thank you, nature. Over time, since nature is visible and God is not, people started to you know, to shuffle the priorities of thinking because they paid more attention to what was more tangible and they focused their effort uh, and their energy on trying to engage nature and thank nature and seeing and giving, the, uh, attributing a power to nature that it doesn't have and attributing volition to, to nature, which it doesn't have and forgetting about God. And that's how God was forgotten. And uh, Abraham came to restore that. So it says here, the, the uh, idolatry originates in the error of ascribing autonomy to the created beings that God, God designated as the conduits for his beneficence. Let's say with the sun and the rain. They are tools of God. They are um, tools for God to give, bring us kindness. And we are saying, wow. The, the sun is shining. Great. Thank you, sun, because we're afraid the sun's not going to, to decide to shine tomorrow. The sun can't decide not to shine tomorrow. God can decide to have a cloudy day. But they don't have the, 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 that autonomy. That's the error. Work is one such conduit. So in a way, if we look at the world that way, say, so God um, blesses me through nature. God blesses me through uh, uh, so many different things that are in God's world where I am benefiting from, from the, the world around me, but it's not because of anybody's particular choice, but because it's a world that God created. Now, when it comes to work, 
could say, okay, but work is my choice. I decide to 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 invest uh, time and ingenuity and, and effort and money. And therefore, when it succeeds, that's that was my decision, because because of my smarts and my education and my networking, I was able to earn this money. What does God have to do with it? And the answer is God is it. Everything to do with it. We work to create conduits for God's blessing. But at the end of the day, we cannot control all variables. And I guess the, the pandemic uh, taught us that also. There, there's just there's so many things beyond our control. And therefore, when we're working, we're, we are, what we're doing is we're creating a condo for God's blessing. And when a person is successful in their business or successful in a business venture, of course, if they made the right decisions, they put an effort, they, they worked the long hours, whatever it is, of course, they, they deserve credit for creating the conduit. But they also should realize that there's probably somewhere in the world, someone who's equally as smart, equally as committed, worked equal hours, and didn't come up with this. They didn't get the, the blessing. Why? What's the difference? The difference is that for, for whatever reason, we don't know, God blessed this endeavor and not blessing that endeavor. And therefore, we're, we're always dependent on the divine. I um, mean, you know, it, it, it's there. My father's a dean at the Rabbinical College, and he's so I remember as, as a, a, a child when he would meet people who I had heard about in, in the press and very, very wealthy people, and he would, he would go speak to them about supporting uh, institutions, Jewish institutions. And I would, you know, I was so. Uh, blown away or you met him and and i remember him telling me he said yes i met him so what but what do you think he is he's a person who, who worked very hard probably and a person who god blessed with success so he is trusted by god which is a, tr a tremendous thing it's a it's a it's a, a vote of confidence by god he's trusted by god to be a a a worthy manager of God's assets. And I'm there, I go to help him uh, use his, the, the help him with his job. But I'm I'm giving him a uh, offering him a place where he can do good with, with his assets. So does is a better person than me and you? He was he's a person who God trusted, and that's it. We should we should have respect for the fact that God trusted him. But I'm there to help him you know, exercise the trust. I'm not. He's not the, uh, I'm not. It doesn't blow me away with how much money he has. So the 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 idea is when we look at him and say, even what we do, whatever we do, is is uh, we're creating conduits for God's blessing with our families, with our health, everything. There's, we we can control. I think we've all learned we can control very you know, only minimally what we can do, but we can control our effort, and we want to put in the effort in the right direction. To create a proper conduit for God's blessing. So work, as we say, work is one such conduit, which is why we are enjoined to work for our livelihood. The person who says, I trust in God so much, and I'm gonna, so God's gonna provide me with the ability to pay the rent, irrespective of of uh, of, uh, of of my work. That makes no sense. That's irresponsible, Judaically. If I want to pay the rent, I got to go to the want ads and find the job. Now, if I am truly working, looking to find the job that's adequate for me, then I pray to God for success. That's something, that's something else. But I've got to, I've got to do my effort. <clears throat> this is why I'm enjoying to work for our livelihood. But asc ascribing our sustenance solely to our own efforts is a subtle form of bowing down to an idol. It is God who blesses our efforts with success. Our job is simply to make a vessel into which he can pour his blessings. So we, alignment with God is very much how, how we see life. We want to be aligned with God so that, because God always wants to give us the blessings, but if God's, if someone's pouring fine wine over here and I have, I have a, you know, a, a cup three inches away, 
I'm not going to get the wine. I have to align my cup with the wine. So I have to align my, my efforts with, with God's blessing. And if I have a business and I have a, an opportunity that seems like, wow, here I can make some money, but it, it's, <clears throat> it's going to be in, in eth, unethical or immoral, then for me to say, well, listen, it's money's money, business is business, and I'm going to, therefore I'm going to do this because I'm going to make some money, that's um, flipping reality on its head. It's, it's making the work and the money into the, the, into the God <clears throat> and thinking that somehow I actually control the outcomes. I mean, to say, I cannot, this, I cannot do this because it doesn't align me for blessing. Even if I get some, I'm, I'm sure that there's guaranteed money there. That could be, but there's not, not going to be any blessing. And uh, the blessing of, of success is is the money that's that has done in, that's in a way of alignment with God. <clears throat> but ascribing ourselves and solely to our efforts is a subtle form of dying down to earth. And it's God to bless our efforts for success. Our job is similar to me. All right, wait, I did that already. Okay, by, by taking care not to invest in, uh, inordinate amounts of time, energy, and thought, we, we, they work. We ensure they will not fall into the error of idolatry, even in a subtle form. Okay, so that's why. There's this oddity that the Torah phrases the, uh, the word, the way we have the, the, the vowelization of this word is six days work shall be done. <laughs> and not like earlier in the Torah, six days you shall do work. Okay. <clears throat> Unless there are any questions, we can move forward. Um, let's go to, to three. Um, actually, let's um, go back to two because I don't know if we read this. Seven days should be whole for you, complete day rest from uh, of work unto God. I'm getting the verse, it's on the left side at the top, verse two. This is the past aspect of observing the Sabbath. Whoever does any of the 39 prohibited types of work on the Sabbath shall be put to death. So it says there are seven, 39 types of creativity. And with these 39 types of creativity, Shabbos is about declaring that this is God's world. And that's really our job, to recognize that this is God's world and it's here for a purpose. The Talmud tells us that when we say um, in our prayers Friday night or in our Kiddush Friday night, both of them, there's this language of Ayichulu HaShamayim V'Aratzuchotzvam, the Torah verse, from Genesis, when it says that God completed the six days, the heavens and the earth and, and all their hosts, and uh, this all on the seventh day. So that is is looking at a job done, and saying this is about God. Not looking at a job done, saying, "Wow, this is beautiful. Oh wow, I'm so lucky. Oh wow, look what I can use." Is wow, this is God made this for a reason. And the Talmud says when we read that, we become God's partner in creation, which is a pretty heavy statement. God created, God created something out of nothing. And we are able to be creative, hopefully, with the ingredients He gave us to make it a better world. But to be God's partner in creation, it seems a little bit grandiose. But the Talmud does say it because God created a product. But that product, the purpose of that product was for it to be recognized by autonomous human beings, by free will human beings. And to look at it and say, this doesn't just exist on its own. And this doesn't just exist for me and my, my, my pleasures. This exists because God wants it used for the right purpose. And when we and we declare it as God, we say, by that God created and finished the heavens and earth, and this is God's world. We are thereby being a partner in God's creation. And if a person is, is rejecting that, then what the, the Talmud is saying is they're really striking at their own, their own purpose of creation. So it's just, you don't, you're not recognizing the, the, the purpose of existence and of our own lives. So it's, there's the external creativity that's, that's, for, or that's prohibited on Shabbos is boiled down to 39 different types 
general types of creativity. Those are 39 different types of creativity that went into building the tabernacle. And we do that a whole week, but not Shabbos. The exception to this is kindling fire. Verse 3. Though you should not kindle fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day, the punishment for doing so is not death, but only lashes. Furthermore, each one of the 39 categories of work is separately prohibited on the Sabbath. Therefore, if you transgress several of them inadvertently, you must atone for each act with a separate sin offering. Okay, the reason they put this, all this in is because the Talmud uh, goes through a pretty uh, lengthy analysis. Why does God, why does Moses specify kindling fire? There are 39 different types of, of, of creativity. Why fire different? So that they're pushing in things that are really much more legalistic in here, but uh, I understand why they felt they needed to do it. Okay, so one wonders why, why fire is is taken out of the 39 and, and specified. So now let's get to the, the tabernacle. 271, verse four. Having exhorted the people to remember what they had heard themselves from God, Moses then related to, to them what God had told them during the last 40 days. So Moses now goes and, and kind of gives a reprise to the Jews of what has gone on. And Moses spoke to the entire congregation of the Israelites saying, this is what God has commanded me to say to you. Take contributions from God among yourselves for the construction of the tabernacle and its accoutrements. Okay, and we did, this is a recap of what we have said. He said, he wants contributions from everyone. This command applies only to you and not to me, Moses is saying, because the fact that God is allowing you to make the tabernacle and the kids has forgiven you for having made the golden calf and is agreeing to let his presence dwell among you. So you guys, the people, you messed up. Creating the tabernacle is your way of, of repairing that. So that's something that you need to do. Since I, Moses, was not involved in the sin, A, I am not required to contribute to the tabernacle, and B, God's presence has remained accessible to me, so I have no technical need for the tabernacle because you, you're you not feeling God's presence, and, and now you want to restore that feeling of presence and connection and, and relationship with God through the tabernacle. Since the tabernacle's purpose is to counteract the negative effect of the incident of the golden calf, you must prepare and donate your contributions expressly for the purpose of fashioning the tabernacle and atoning for having made the golden calf. So this is there's something the um, in, in Jewish thought called a kavana, kavana, which means intent. And very often in mitzvahs, the, the most important part of the mitzvah is that it gets done. And your intent is important, but it's it's not a, it's not a deal breaker. So if someone gives charity to a poor person. Uh, for a, for some reason, there's a, a selfish uh, ego motive. That's not good, but it's a mitzvah stuff. You know why? Because the poor person has the money. You know, they have they have food for they have money for food. So in in many of the mitzvahs, what is the intent, the lack of a proper intent, makes it maybe a bit of a, a, a lame mitzvah, but it's a mitzvah nonetheless. Some mitzvahs need to have a, a, um, intent, and without the intent. There's no mitzvah. And here, the saying is that this, they needed, this, this was not only about building a tabernacle. This was about restoring a relationship with God. So, you know, if you think about two people in, in, a, in a meaningful relationship, and one of them wants to, uh, to apologize to the other and, and try to restore the relationship and buy something. But clearly, when they bring it, they're not. They're, there's no sentiment in it. They're just they're they're, they're depositing it. They're they're just they're, they're bringing it. It doesn't mean anything. It's not about the card or the ring or the kugel. It's about uh, the sentiment that goes into it. So here, the 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 tabernacle. This was about a relationship, and therefore it, it has to be. There, the, the contributions have to be expressed for that purpose. Then it says, let every generous hearted person bring the contribution for God. Your generosity and alacrity in donating materials for the tabernacle will demonstrate the extent to which you regret your involvement in the incident of the golden calf and your desire to have God dwell again among you. Following materials are needed, gold, silver, and copper. Okay, so there is something 
We call it generosity and we call it alacrity uh, that we're putting in here. There is, we can see within people on the human level, when they're doing something, there's what they're doing and then there's how they're doing it. And there's one senses, even if it's not concrete, can sense sometimes that they're doing it, but because they have to, or just because why not, or because there's there's a, a feeling there. And one of the things is alacrity. Alacrity means doesn't you know necessarily doing it right away, although that is something, but that there's there's that there's a um, a sense of enthusiasm that means something. That I'm happy to be able to do this. And I see that all the time, that, in, that there's a, a, a sense of that this is important to me. And that goes with any mitzvah. And that there's this idea of, I mean, how do we, we show the next generations? Is it some this or what the mitzvahs we do because I don't know, this is what Jews do. Or that this is something meaningful to me and to, uh, to convey a living Judaism to the people around us, the idea to say this is a, 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 a real and, and uh, contemporary value to me, I find it meaningful right now, is something that resonates strongly. You know, there was a, a, a rabbi in, um, in Maplewood, in Newark, in Maplewood for many years, and there's Rabbi Sheldon Gordon. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him, but he was, he was quite a figure, a Chabad rabbi. Um, he didn't technically uh, have a Chabad house or Chabad institution. He was a rabbi of a, of a, um, a community shul, I'm a very, very special man. And um, <clears throat> one of the things he used to say is that, you know, I can remember, I'm, I'm, he passed away maybe 10, 15 years ago, but said that he, he, he loves the idea that people bring, you know, bring their old uh, clothing for rummage sales for charity. He says that that's a Torah value. Things shouldn't be wasted and like other people can use it. It's great. He said, but, but our kids need to see that we also bring, we give new things and we give things that we do need. And we give money that we can buy something that we want today. <laughs> if if, they, if, they, if the, the, the impression we're giving children is things we don't want anymore, we can give to poor people, that's not a good lesson. So we, we give to, to charity what's things that, that we could use today to make ourselves a, a pleasurable life. We also give things that, 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 that we can afford to give, of course, we'll let, let people take a benefit from it. But the... And again, this isn't an alacrity thing, but it's an enthusiasm thing. It's a sense of, of uh, arti feeling and articulating that this is a, a real value to me. That's what brings a mitzvah to life. And in this case, we're saying also, which a generous hearted person saying, and, and a lot of this, by the way, I really believe a lot of this is an education of how we were brought up, but the, but although it's, we can always uh, shift, but it's just a little more difficult sometimes. A generous hearted person was saying that there's, we feel good that we're using our things to better the community. So in, in note number five, all the way to the right side of 271, the Hasidic insights, let every generous hearted person bring the contribution for God. Besides demonstrating the extent to which they regretted their involvement in the golden calf and their desire for God to once again dwell among them, the people's enthusiasm in participating personally in offering the material for constructing the tabernacle affected the very nature of the tabernacle itself. So here, that sense of enthusiasm has an impact. Like I was saying, some, it, if I just gave uh, a poor person you know, 50 bucks to help them pay their, their rent, the, my intent is irrelevant to them. They have the 50 bucks. But here, this is about a relationship. And it happened to also be the expression of the relationship with, with, with donating. So it affected the very nature of the tabernacle. When God gave the, Mount, the Torah Mount Sinai, it was a rel, rel, relatively an act of his own initiative. 
as we have already seen, a revelation from above that is initiated from above has both advantages and disadvantages. Okay, we're going back into this a little bit. We discussed it already. We definitely did. Is that there's a top down from our bottoms up, I guess. It's God acted on us by giving us the Torah. We didn't ask for it. We weren't prepared for it. We just come out of Egypt and God gave us this gift. There's a beauty to that, but there's a disadvantage. The advantage, the advantage of such a revelation is that it's not limited by the capacity of the recipients, since no preparatory work was done. God's giving. God's going to give what God, what God wants to give. It's not how much I asked for, how much I, it, it's, it's, or, or how, if I properly prepared for this. It's God gave it. God need not concern himself with accommodating such preparations. And if God can give it to me and doesn't, doesn't have to, you know, taper the, the divine for my, uh, what, in, uh, what I need. I mean, if God's giving, God's giving. The disadvantage is that since there was no preparation, the recipients have no way of retaining the revelation they receive, and therefore its effects are transitory. Means there's not, you want to plant, you take um, <clears throat> seeds, very expensive seeds, very, uh, you know, uh, exotic ones, and I put them here on my table, nothing's going to happen, even though they are a blessing because I didn't do any preparatory work. I have to go into the right receptacle. I have to go into earth. There has to be preparation made. And if not, then the blessing kind of just can bounce off if there isn't an open heart and an open mind, fertile ground for it to, to, to be able to, to hit. So the effects we say are, are transitory. Thus, this, thus despite... On 272, the transcendent revelations that accompany the giving of the Torah, the effect was only temporary. The mountain was so holy during the revelation that anyone who touched it was liable to die. But as soon as the revelation was over, it reverted to its mundane state. If you look at the, 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 the account of the, of the giving of the Torah earlier on in this book of the Torah, it says no one should go, touch the mountain. That they so good, uh, like uh, cordon off the mountain. No one's allowed to touch the mountain. Touch the mountain, they'll die. It's, it's, God's presence is there. And then it says at the end of Sinai, it says there will be a shofar blast, at which time the, the heavenly presence ascends, and then it says everybody can go on the mountain. So the mountain it was holiness, 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 and no one's allowed to go there. And then as soon as the episode is over, you, your, your, your goats and the sheep can go graze there, do whatever you want there. It's not holy anymore. What, what do you mean it's not holy? It was a holy place. It's like, well, the, the, the temple is holy, right? It didn't, it, it didn't hit. It didn't, it didn't grab hold in, in the physical world because there wasn't preparation. The mountain was so holy during the revelation that anyone touched it was liable to die. But as soon as the revelation was over, it returned, reverted to its mundane state. The Jewish people achieved the spirit, exalted spiritual level of Adam before the sin, but this did not prevent them from sinning with the golden calf mirror 40 days later. It's, it's, it, it, you talk about it in, you know, in, in metaphor, and we talk about what, what happened with the, with the, the chauffeur blast, it's, the mountains only, and then, then it's gone, and then look what happened. We, were, we, we, we saw God. It was, people, their souls left, and they, this, it was an incredible, um, uh, uh, the most incredible spiritual experience ever, ever experienced in, in, in in, in this world, in our history. And then 40 days later, they're, they're, they're making golden calf. It didn't take hold because there wasn't the proper preparation. It didn't take root. With the construction of the tabernacle, however, the people participated in preparing for the revelation that was about uh, that was to occur upon its completion. Here, we were partners with God. We're making ourselves into receptacles for God. And therefore, the blessing and the revelation is going to be able to take root and, and bear fruit. Therefore, via the, the Tabernacle, holiness became part and parcel of our existence. Thought this indeed was its essence. God made his home among us. In this context, the enthusiasm with, with which the people donated materials toward the tabernacle's construction expressed their willingness to have God dwell among them permanently. Their generosity and alacrity were what confused the tabernacle with this quality, and by extension, what enabled the people themselves to be fit for the ongoing revelation of God's presence in their own lives. So the idea. Um, leave it there, is that we want to have divine inspiration, we want to have divine blessing, but if we want it to be real, we want to prepare ourselves so that 
when we have the inspiration, we, it, it's, it's a seed that we were going to, that we're going to grow. We have the blessing. We are seeing it, not, we're not just inanimate conduits, but we are part of the action where we have our souls, even to take a little blessing we have to help us grow spiritually. So I'm going to leave it over there. I have an appointment in Rahway, so I'm, as I mentioned before, so I don't, I, I think I'm going to have to go now. If anyone has any questions, uh, hit the body, you can shoot me a note and I can, maybe can bring it up next week. But otherwise, wish you all a great week. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye.